I'll introduce the panel today. So I'm Angie Crush. I'm a partner in the employment department here at Thomas Mansfield. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, Alex Kiernan and Antonia Brewer. Hi, everybody. Um, now, many of you may have already watched our webinars and or be our clients, but for anyone that hasn't watched previously, um, I'll tell you a bit about Thomas Mansfield. So we specialize in employment law in my team, but we also have family and private client teams. Um, here in the employment law team, we tend to work very often with HR teams, HR managers, and sometimes business owners who perhaps don't have a dedicated HR function. And today we're going to be discussing redundancy and restructure. And we really recently released a downloadable guide to redundancy for employers. And we saw a lot of downloads of this. So we recognize that you know, perhaps this is a, a good topic at the moment. And maybe the current economic climate might leave some employers with some tough decisions to make, perhaps looking to trim their businesses down. In the sidebar, hopefully you can see a link where you should be able to download the redundancy guide um, and you can keep that as a sort of handy reference tool um, to refer back to some of the points that we're going to be covering today. Um, if you have any problems downloading it, just pop something in the chat and we'll get it sent through to you afterwards. Um, as always, please do ask questions um, as we go through and we'll try to answer them. Just pop your questions in the chat box and we'll get those answered at some point during the webinar if we can. Um, just as a bit of a heads up, we're not going to be covering collective redundancies in any depth today, as we'd probably need a two hour webinar to, to cover that as well. But, um, you know, if you require any advice on this, of course, we can provide this, you know, and, and we can speak to you about that later. So, Antonia, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, can you start us off with an explanation as to what redundancy means in law? Yes. Well, there are three situations in which a legal redundancy can occur. You have type one, where the whole business closes. You've got type two, where the workplace closes. For example, one office closes. And then you have type three, where there is a reduced need for employees to carry out work of a particular kind. So the first two, the business and workplace closure, are usually pretty clear cut and easy to define. It's the third type, the reduced need for employees to carry out work, their particular work that can be more complex. And the precise statutory definition is important because not only does it affect whether the employee is entitled to a redundancy payment or not, but redundancy is also a potentially fair reason for dismissal. And we do come across situations where employers incorrectly label dismissals as redundancies, and this is where the threat of litigation comes. And turning to that third type, as you say, the sort of trickier one, a reduced need for employees to do work of a particular kind, what does that actually mean? Well, essentially it, it means what it says, that there's a reduction in a particular type of work, which means the employer no longer needs the same number of people employed to do it. So the starting point when dealing with this kind of situation is for the employer to clearly define the kind of work that's reducing and the why, and the focus needs to be on the tasks and the skills actually performed. So this should be done before looking at who's carrying out the roles. And by doing this, identifying the work and the why, then you can move on to identify the job roles that this scenario is likely to affect and identify the individuals who are going to be at risk. And so where businesses say, you yeah, know, they say their requirements are reduced, how would an employment tribunal decide whether this is in fact the case? Well, the requirements of the business are essentially a commercial decision to be applied by the business itself. So from the employment tribunal's point of view, that the only thing they're going to be looking at is, is it genuine uh, or is there evidence to suggest it's a sham? Otherwise, they're not really going to be looking at the business rationale behind the decision or whether it was a reasonable decision to make or not, as long as it appears to make sense on the face of it. You know, they're not going to be making a judgment on the business sense behind the decision. Uh, so, you know, by way of example, there was a particular case where it, it was shown that there was a continuing demand for a particular course to be taught at the University of Newcastle. 
However, redundancy was still upheld as the reason for the dismissal. The employer was entitled to decide that it couldn't afford to offer the course following a cut in funding. And what about the sort of position with restructure? I mean, we often hear redundancy and restructure um, sort of in the same sentence. I mean, is restructure the same as redundancy? No, the simple answer is no. Uh, they are different. <laughs> However, essentially, a plan to restructure may or may it may result in in redundancies or may not. So we often find it can be the driving business reason behind a redundancy proposal. So they can go hand in hand, but not always. It's not uncommon for an employer to restructure a department without it resulting in the need to make any redundancies. You know, sometimes an employer may have the same amount of work to be done but will simply be trying to change the structure so fewer people do the work. And in that case, there, there will be a crossover between redundancy and restructuring, and, and then it may satisfy the test for both. And I think that's true. There's often so often a, a bit of a crossover that, um, you know, we see the, use, the terms used interchangeably. Have you got any particular sort of top tips on, on that area? I think it's really important to establish from the outset whether the process, and that's whether it's a restructuring or redundancy, is going to end up with fewer people needing to do particular roles. So once you've established that, then you need to be looking at which of the three redundancy scenarios you're dealing with. And if you're in the reduced requirement for a particular role scenario, then you need to try and keep, in, keep your mind on the role and the work that's done by that role and not the attributes of a particular individual. And that can be quite hard to do. So you've got to try and keep an open mind as far as you can until the end of the process. And I guess just, you know, really important, not jumping in feet first. What you put in at the planning stage will really pay off later. Thanks, Antonia. So... Alex, Antonia mentioned planning. Can you convince us why planning is so important in redundancies? Well, I hope so. Um, yeah, look, let's be honest. Planning rarely invokes enthusiasm, and certainly not with some of the clients that I work with who are, who are very much sort of a little bit shoot-from-the-hip type entrepreneurs. Um, but I, I, I do think it is vitally important in this type of process to, to do that. And, um, you know, I, I think... Some of the key reasons why it's important is obviously if you plan well um, you're going to have a smoother process um, both for employer and employees um, and that equals less costs and less stress generally speaking um, you know you ideally don't want to be changing your reasons um, and your proposals halfway through in a major way um, because that makes you look uncertain and employees can jump on that you need to go into these things with with confidence um, it's also the planning stage is a real prime opportunity to create documents that are going to evidence at a later stage. Should there be a dispute, let's say someone accuses you of you know, engineering this for discriminatory reasons, you've already created some evidence there that will show, hopefully, the genuine thought process behind a potential redundancy before those accusations have been made. Um, so really important. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, I think we've definitely all had cases where you know, something gets disclosed or comes to light just before an employer was about to embark on a redundancy process, you yeah. know, whether it's you know, an intention to take family leave or a disability. And of course, it's going to make the redundancy announcement look really bad, uh, you know, and the timing's really bad. But if a business knows they've got those backup documents, they're going to be in such a stronger position to simply just go ahead with their plans, um, you know, as they were originally made. So obviously, planning will vary depending on circumstances but are there any key recommendations um that you you might have <clears throat> there are I, I think number one something that i pretty much always recommend an employer to do is to start off by creating your own written business rationale um you know essentially a document i normally say to people it doesn't need to be extensive like one page maybe just into two pages um and what this is, is you're justifying to yourself what your own thinking process is in writing. Um, so it's you fleshing out your and defining your strategic plans um, and, and in doing so, making them more legally resilient. Uh, so in terms of things to cover, I normally would say, 
uh, you know, look at what changes are you proposing? Everything should be proposals at that stage. Um, what's driving that? You know, I, I don't know. Is there a particular department that's making losses? Is that the, the driving factor? Set that out in there. Um, how, what's the length of these bands? Is this a medium plan, long-term plan? Um, obviously what effect might this have on job roles, reflecting on that, potentially redundancy. Um, are you going to create any jo new job roles? And the other thing that also comes from that is, is looking at the amount. Um, we've talked about collective redundancy, you know, are you going to be up to that 20 or more employees um, level, or is it going to be much lower than that? It gives you the opportunity to plan and, and be prepared going in. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, it sounds like a really obvious one, but check your own policies. If you have a policy that deals with the, you know, a redundancy policy, for example, make sure you read it and you follow it. That sounds like a really, really obvious one, but I've seen so many clients not do that. And not following your own policies is a, a good way to lose a tribunal claim. Um, do remember to look at alternatives to compulsory redundancy throughout the process. And I, you know, as part and parcel of that, what you should be doing is looking at things like, well, are there any self-employed contractors? They should be, you should be looking at ending those relationships before you get rid of the employees. Um, you know, can you offer flexible working? Can you look at shorter hours for those existing staff? Uh, can you cut overtime, for example, short time working? Would layoffs work for your business? Um, Obviously, then there's the one of looking at other roles within the company. Are there any suitable alternatives for the individuals who are at risk of redundancy? Um, voluntary redundancy is another one and, and, and early retirement is another. So there's lots and lots of things to just think about and contemplate. And many of those won't be appropriate in lots of situations, but it's part of showing a fair process looking at them. And the other one is, is thinking and considering what redundancy pools you're going to have and matrices. But I think we're going to talk about that slightly later. Thanks. And that's all really good strategic advice on the planning stage. What about sort of the practical side of planning? What considerations should employers yeah. be thinking about there? Yeah, of course, really important as well. Some people get a bit obsessed with the sort of theoretical, but on the practical level, you know, it's, it's thinking of those things such as, well, who's actually going to do this consultation? Are they capable of doing it? Have they had training? Do they need legal support in relation to that? What time frames are you going to work to? Um, you know, how will the reliancy consultation meetings themselves work? Are you going to do those on a video call? Are you going to do them in person? You've got meetings available. Practical things like that. It's really worth thinking those through because it really disrupts the process if you haven't done so and you're in the middle of it. Um, have you got key information for employees? You know, get their contracts together. Know what their terms are. Know what their notice periods are, for example. Think about what redundancy payments will be due. Um, Key one as well, don't forget about those those absent employees. You know, you might have some people off, off sick or women on maternity leave, for example. They need to be involved in this so far as you can as well. So, so don't just forget about people that aren't in, in the office, as I have seen happen. Um, I think another big one as well is, is, you know, most employers will have a pretty good idea at the start if there are certain employees who are going to struggle with that process more than others. Inevitably, it's going to be, a, you know, it's, it's a stressful process for people. It's, it's not nice for people to go through. So it's preempting who might struggle more. And in relation to that, then thinking about what support could be offered to those people particularly. Of course, we've got some people who potentially might have a disability. There's a duty to make reasonable adjustments, you know, and that feeds into that as well. So consider all of these things. And, and it might sound like I'm a bit biased, but this is definitely a stage where it's worthwhile looking at getting legal advice because I think getting that early advice at that stage for a planning perspective is one of the most critical points. And of course we would say that wouldn't we but um, you know but genuinely spending one or two hours talking through your plans just sense checking it all um, you know with a solicitor beforehand where we can sort of flag danger areas um, or you know maybe suggest amendments to the process it will save time in preventing challenges and you know ultimately tribunal claims later down the line so I definitely echo that and so let's say you've done your planning you're sort of ready to embark on the consultation Antonia can you tell us a bit more about the actual consultation process yes of course it's really important because the dismissal will be unfair if an employer doesn't warn and consult with its employees and um, 
You, you have to bear in mind, you know, consultation is about giving employees a chance to have their say. They have to be given the opportunity to understand in greater detail the reason for their potential selection for redundancy. If there's a pool or there's going to be assessment criteria to be used, then there should be a discussion on ways uh, on how that's going to, to work. And of course, discussions on ways on how to avoid redundancy. I mean, when it's more cut and dried, so there's a particular office closing down, a business site uh, closing a, a significant geographical relocation, there's going to be less room for discussion. Uh, but it's going to be more controversial when it's about a, a, a number of people being selected for redundancy and there are a few remaining posts. So, you know, in that case, um, that kind of case will inform the extent and type of consultation that is required. But the key components are to consult when the proposals are still at a formative stage, not when they've already been decided and to make sure that employees do get the adequate information they need on which they can respond and to ensure they get adequate time to do so. And it's really important for an employer to engage meaningfully in the process and to give consideration to the employee's responses throughout the consultation. And I think that's absolutely right. I, you know, always try and drill clients in, you know, make sure all your language is theoretical, you know, until that final sort of confirmation of redundancy, both in letters and in the meetings, because it's very easy to uh, sort of step into the language of, oh, you know, this is happening. Um, also, a question we often get asked is how long does the consultation have to last? Because, you know, obviously, employers want to get through it as quickly as possible. Um, you know, is one meeting enough? Well, there's not a rule as such about how long a consultation process should last unless the collective redundancy rules apply. But it does need to be long enough to be meaningful and effective. So we normally suggest at least two meetings. It, it may be appropriate to have a third or more on occasions, uh, but usually two, two should be sufficient. But you should be thinking in weeks, not days, in most cases, because the shorter the period, the more likely it is the quality of the consultation is going to be called into question. Thanks. And Alex, we talked earlier about pools and what happens when there are a number of people carrying out the same role um, or broadly the same role. Um, how are employers supposed to decide who goes and who stays? Yeah. Um, so I should probably say, you know, you can have situations where you just have a unique job role, right? And in that case, you're effectively you're having a pool of one. There's only one person that does that type of job. Um, you know, and that was established in a case which is uh, Wrexham Golf Club versus Ingham, where they just had a, a, a one individual, I think he was a club steward. There was an argument around, he said other people should be involved. Um, and it was held that, no, it's sufficient just to have one person if that role is fairly unique. Um, so following that line, really, it's, it's just thinking about, the issue really arises where you have, um, several people who are doing the same or very similar types of role and in that situation um, it's just largely having a bit of a common sense think about um, who should be grouped together given the nature of of the role and it's looking at things like seniority and obviously the work that's being carried out so a redundancy pool in short is just a way of categorizing affected employees into groups so that then you can uh, decide whether or not you need to apply a selection matrix. Um, there aren't any fixed rules about exactly how you should define a pool. So it is very much down to, to the employer. And there's another case, Thomas Manufacturing Limited and Harding, which, which confirmed that. Um, so to give a very brief example, if you had five uh, marketing assistants, five designers, um, and you were going to reduce both teams by one, it would be logical to divide them into a marketing assistance pool and a designer's pool. And then once you've got that, you're going to need to um, look at a criteria on which you pick that one person out of those two defined pools. Thanks, Alex. And Antonia, what issues should an employer be alive to when deciding upon pools for selection? Well, as Alex has mentioned, it's fair to say an employer has a fairly wide discretion over the choice of pools. <clears throat> 
but it is more complicated when employees are multi-skilled and do different types of work or can be required to, to do so under their contracts of employment. So you need to look at their contracts, but you also need to look beyond that and look at the work that they actually do. So the following considerations would normally be sensible to bear in mind. You know, if an employee has previously done other work, other than the kind of work disappearing, then this should alert the employer to the fact that those skills may be interchangeable with other employees. So in that case, a wider pool may be called for. And if the work is low skilled, uh, such as work on a production line, those skills may be more likely to be regarded as interchangeable. But having said that, case law does confirm that it is perfectly reasonable for an employer to confine the pool to those doing the same or similar work to one another. Usually you find it's the employer's interest to keep the pool as narrow as possible, whilst the employee will be wanting to keep it as wide as possible so that um, they, they include as many similar roles, which of course will reduce their chances of being selected. And can you pool across different locations? Well, broadly speaking, yes, people could be carrying out the same job from a number of different locations, particularly in these post-COVID times. Many people are home-based and there's no particular requirement to be at a place of work. So the key is really looking at the work being carried out. That's the focus, not the location of the employee. OK, and Alex, once the um, pool has been formed, can you go into a bit more detail about the scoring matrix? Yeah, sure. So um, in simple terms, uh, the scoring matrix or a selection matrix, as it's sometimes called, um, all it is is just creating a set of criteria under which you're going to score one employee against another or, or the group of employees against one another. Um, and the idea is you uh, create a criteria that's going to enable um, a relatively objective um, assessment of of whatever whatever skills or criteria you're you're picking to determine which individual is made redundant. Um, and we thought actually, I think if one of my colleagues can get it up, um, we thought we'd just put on screen briefly an example of what one. Oh, there it is, like magic. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and what you can see there on the left hand side is the criteria in bold column, far left column. You know, in, in this example, we've got quite a lot of criteria. You know, we've got things like quality of work, technical ability. You can see that we've got things like disciplinary record, you know, um, and several others. In the next few columns, what you can see is the sort of key as to how each of those criteria would be judged. So it gives you a nice formula as to how management are judging this. Um, so one point at the low end and four points at the top end. Then finally, we've got the scores on the right. And I'm not sure if you can see it on your screen, but at the bottom of that, then there's a there's a total score that is then given to the person. So it's these often, you know, they can really vary. Um, and I suppose the key thing I would say is um, it is very it, important for an employer to carefully think about what attributes they're going to score their employees against um, the, and it needs to be relevant to that job and you know we spend a lot of time discussing those with employers and working with them to select them i have to say and, and i should say in relation to we've given you this example just because there's there's lots there to have a look at um, but i normally recommend that you keep it relatively simple i think there's something like 12 different categories here my view is I think keep it simple go like four to seven range I've seen some employers make this really really complex with like loads of different spreadsheets and I just think that's unnecessary um, and I think it confuses the employees I think it can confuse the employer themselves and actually it just if there is a dispute about it at a later date it just makes everything much more complex to defend um, so keep it relatively simple but give careful thought to that criteria I would say um, and I've mentioned objective, at least some of the criteria ideally you want as objective, but you can have some subjective elements. Um, ideally, what you don't want to do is just rely on the sort of vague view of one manager, essentially. Hmm. And Antonia, are there any um, selection criteria that an employer should actively avoid? <laughs> 
Well, as Alex said, criteria should be objective and measurable as far as possible, rather than just being based on personal opinion. If they are subjective, which, which is okay to, to some degree, they should be capable of being measured objectively. So some examples. Uh, which yeah, are some specific examples that might be useful. Well, I was just going to say, there are some examples I can give which have been found to be too vague, imprecise, uh, or subject, uh, subjective. So uh, there was uh, employees who, in the opinion of the manager concerned, would keep the company viable. Uh, so that, that was one that was found to be uh, too subjective. Uh, employees who were best suited for the needs of the business. Uh, another case, uh, where attitude was described as being an undesirable criterion, being dangerously ambiguous and vague. So those are some cases where the tribunal didn't uh, like those uh, criteria, but there is ambiguity in case law and not all subjective criteria have been found to be unfair. So for example, a subjective criterion that the employment tribunal found to be fair was an employee's trajectory and future potential. So you can see how that there is an element of subjectivity in, in that. A particular case, Nichols and Rockwell Automation Limited, a 2012 case, an employee was assessed for redundancy through a points-based system. Um, the tribunal went through this exercise and decided it was unfair for two reasons. First, because some of the criteria were not capable of objective assessment. And second, because some of the marks given to the claimant do not actually reflect what was recorded in the relevant documentary evidence. The EAT then rejected this approach. They noted that the tribunal made no findings as to why the markers had attributed the marks they did to the items in question and therefore had no basis for assessing whether they were reasonable. Rather, the tribunal had fallen into the error of substituting its own view for that of the employer. And this was later affirmed in the case the same year of Mitchells of Lancaster Brewers Limited and Tattersall, mm. where it was said, it's not fair to object to criteria simply on the basis that they are subjective. Not every criterion has to be objective. The question is whether overall the redundancy criteria were reasonable. That a criterion is subjective does not necessarily mean it can't be assessed in a dispassionate or objective way. Thanks. And on that specific criteria of performance and ability, that tends to be one that employers focus on. Are there any problems that crop up with that one? Well, performance and ability are, are usually key considerations in a redundancy exercise. And it is particularly helpful where there's written evidence to back up the scoring. So for example, you've got written appraisals, which the employee has signed off, or by reference to facts and figures, you've got revenue generation, such as pipeline figures, sales, billing figures, then this is going to be much easier to justify. Common problems that arise in relation to assessment of performance based on appraisals are, for example, that appraisals haven't been carried out regularly, or that some of the staff, or hasn't been carried out with all the staff in the pool, then you're going to have a problem. Um, and of course, appraisals may have been carried out by different managers, and not all of them will have the same approach. So when scoring performance and criteria, we would always suggest scoring to be undertake, undertaken by more than one manager if possible. And that reduces the risk of any suggestion of personal <coughs> animosity or bias. And remember, of course, you can choose to weight certain criteria. If you think a particular skill is really important to the role, uh, you can weight that. And that's quite common. Thanks, Antonia. And we do have a question that someone has asked, which is about whether the employer should consult on the proposed selection criteria. Um, and I, I suppose, I think Antonia might touch on this a bit later when she's talking about the sort of the, the consultation process itself. But um, I mean, generally, in an ideal world, yes, they would consult on the pro proposed selection criteria. Um, 
obviously there are areas that employers always sort of look to trim the process and potentially sometimes they don't. Um, and I think, you know, you have to look at it on a case by case basis as to whether that might impact the sort of fairness of the overall consultation. But certainly the starting point would be that they should consult on the proposed selection criteria before they sort of go ahead um, with the scoring, et cetera, on that basis. Would you would you agree with that, both of you? Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, certainly employers weight certain areas um, and as Antonia said very commonly it will be the skills areas because they are the areas that are particularly important to the employer going forward. Um, what, what are the danger areas for example using uh, attendance records Antonia? Well, when an employer wants to refer to att attendance records that, that's fine but it is important just to check the accuracy uh, of the information and consider the reasons behind the absence. That's really key because you've got to give consideration as to whether any particular period of absence should be discounted. And that would be if it's for a pregnancy related uh, reason or a disability related absence. Okay. And what about giving employees the results of the scoring? What's the situation around that? Well, you do need to give them the, the results because they need to have the opportunity to challenge their scoring as part of that individual consultation. You don't have to show employees other people's scores, but there has been case law that says they should be told the break even point. OK, and Alex, <coughs> what about suitable alternative employment and um, mm. when should this be considered um, in a sort of process? Yeah, uh, I mean, basically throughout the entire process from start to end, suitable alternative employment is a, is a really sort of key linchpin in terms of showing a, a fair and genuine process. Um, so right up until the point of dismissal, if, if there happens to be a role that looks like suitable alternative employment, it's your duty to consider that. Um, if I could say a couple more points on that, actually, I, I think... Um, it's important to say as well, there isn't a requirement to just create a role, right? When we're talking about suitable alternative employment, it's roles that are, are going to be there anyway or were pre pre planned. Um, you're not required to just create a whole new thing for an employee to avoid redundancy. Um, the, the other thing I think is relevant to mention on this point is um, group companies. That can be quite a tricky one. Um, we've had some case law. Essentially, there's, there's a case Barrett construction. Um, where it was it was held that there was no obligation for an employer to look at vacancies um, within independent companies within a group. So, you know, there's no requirement for a subsidiary to say, well, we have to look at all the other group companies and see whether there's jobs over there. Um, however, it's a bit of a thorny issue and a bit of a grey area because there's another case that's more recent than that called Euroguard Limited and Rycroft, where essentially they did find that um, it was unfair for an employer to um, it, exert, it failed to exert its its influence over uh, one of the other group companies and, and it was found it, it could have and it potentially could have secured alternative employment but failed to do so. Um, and a key aspect in that in that finding, which seems to contradict the first, was that there was a that they found there was a high degree of control that could have been exercised but but wasn't. Um, so I mentioned that because it's a bit of a, a, a sort of thorny issue. My personal view is, look, if you're in a group of companies, the safest option would be just to consider that and show that you've taken that into account. And, and if there aren't any suitable alternatives, you know, in a way you've kind of ticked that box, you've looked at it. Um, the, the other thing that often crops up with suitable alternatives is, um, you know, one, the definition of suitable alternatives. So perhaps I start with that in terms of, um, you know, a suitable alternative role needs to be a role that um, is deemed to be very, very similar in terms of seniority and the work being undertaken, um, that they, you know, they can just largely just move straight into it. There is a, a sort of careful difference between a suitable alternative role, which has a particular legal definition, and another vacancy somewhere off. Then it can often be the case that there aren't any suitable alternative roles, but there does happen to be some other vacancies, you know, knocking around elsewhere within the company. Um, you know, there's another case, uh, Ralph Martindale and Company Limited versus Harris, where um, essentially there were there were what should have been deemed to be some suitable alternative um, roles, 
but they uh, those vacancies for those roles were opened up to everybody before uh, being offered to those at risk of redundancy. And, and the principle really behind that is, if it's a suitable alternative, you should be offering first dibs essentially to to those that are facing uh, redundancy. If it's a not deemed a suitable alternative, then you can open up a competitive process. Um, and it's for the employer to sort of sensibly decide uh, which it would be. Um, it's also worth just, just mentioning, you know, technically, um, if there is a suitable alternative role that's offered and it's unreasonably refused, that can be a basis for um, withholding statutory redundancy pay. But I have to yeah. say that's, that's very rare. I, very rare I've ever had that happen. Yeah, same here. I've not had it happen often, although, there, you know, it is sometimes difficult. Employers might think that just because someone can do a role that's available, that it, therefore it's suitable and they should take it. But it, of course, it involves looking at so many other things, you know, yeah. development, prospects, responsibilities, status, all of those things yeah. um, in that test. So it, it can sometimes be one that requires a bit more advice before you sort of make a decision on it. So we've had a look at the sort of various elements of the, the process in some detail. Antonia, can you talk us about how it works in practice, the actual nuts and bolts of the process, having the meetings, etc.? Yes. So step one consists of making the announcement. And depending on the situation and how many people are affected, this may consist of a general announcement, which may be suitable if the whole place is closing down or an informal meeting with the affected employees, putting them on notice of the proposal for change. Now, at this point, they should be informed that a formal meeting will follow, and at that meeting, they'll be given more information. So the announcement will be followed up with an invitation to the first formal consultation meeting. And the letter should set out details of the proposed redundancy the business rationale behind it and explain the process with anticipated timings. And remember that employees should be given a reasonable amount of time to prepare for that meeting and should be told they can bring along a work colleague or a trade union rep uh, if, if they'd like. So the next stage would be the first consultation meeting. And at that, the employer will set out their proposals in greater detail, the reasons for them, and explain what alternatives to redundancies have been considered and why these may not be viable. The employer may have alternative roles it's, it's able to offer at this point. And if there are going to be, if there's going to be a selection pool and matrix are going to be used, then these should be discussed if relevant. And, and this is where we, we're going back to what the question was early, earlier, Angie, with regard to, to discussion about the, the pool and the matrix that would take place at this point. So the employee should be given the opportunity to provide input and to, answer, to ask questions and all the issues. This meeting would then be followed up ideally with a letter which would confirm all the information that was given during that meeting in writing. And the next stage, if applicable, would be when the scoring would take place. I'm using the agreed, the agreed criteria and the scoring guidelines. So that would happen. Then this would be followed by the next meeting, and this would be the second formal consultation meeting, which would involve inviting those employees who've now been selected to discuss further their provisional selection. Now, if they've gone through the selection exercise, they should be informed of the outcome, what their scorings are, and be given the opportunity to comment. And the meeting should provide the opportunity for further conversation and to update employees on any changes, if any new alternative positions have been uh, considered, you know, if there's still answers to questions, um, you know, these, these should be given. So it's an important meeting to provide the opportunity for further conversation and to update on changes. If there are still further questions at this meeting, it may be appropriate to give these answers in writing or possibly there may be a need for a further meeting. Uh, that's, that's a sort of case by case decision. Ideally, if that, that second meeting, the decision has, uh, the decision is able to be made that the post is now to be made redundant, then that, that can be made with a letter following in which it sets out that the dismissal by reason of redundancy is confirmed, uh, 
the reason for that and a summary of what the process has been. And of course, it should also contain practical information like um, the last date of employment, the arrangements for return of company property and so forth, and details of payments due to the employee. Okay. And I think that's a great overview of the ideal process. And, you know, certainly that, you know, there's a lot in there. And I always like to give uh, in clients a sort of checklist of all the stages and, you know, when you send the letter, et cetera, and how many days, just so it's really easy for them to follow it through. Um, and, of course, that's the ideal process that you've just described. We all know that many employers will want to condense the process as much as possible, very often perhaps because they don't want to panic a whole department and sort of start a consultation with everyone. And I guess this is where we can guide you on which steps you can perhaps trim a bit off of the process fairly safely um, or where, you know, what areas you definitely wouldn't want to take a risk on, for example. And I think just listening to you, one of the other points I'd always um, sort of emphasise is um, you know, if something does crop up, crop up in what had intended to be the final meeting and an employee puts some suggestion of saving their job or something, for the sake of another few days, just going away and considering it and take, taking it up with whoever, just wait that few days rather than just saying no and dismissing something out of hand. You know, just um, always take the couple of extra days so that your process is safe. Um, I think that's sort of something that I've definitely tried to to instill in clients over the years. And Antonio, what about the opportunity to appeal? Should employers be giving the opportunity to appeal redundancies? You, you don't have to offer the opportunity to appeal, uh, but our advice does differ depending on the reason behind the request. So if there's some new issue that's arisen, uh, if there's a concern relating to, for example, discrimination, then it would be appropriate to listen to what the employee has to say. You know, that would be quite important at, at that point to have uh, an appeal hearing and allow them that forum. However, you know, if it's to do with the process itself um, and, and issues relating to that, ideally, these should have been dealt with throughout the process. You know, proper consultation process ought to negate the need for any appeal because the matter could and should have been dealt with as part of the consultation process. If a defect in the process has been raised, for example. So I'm afraid it's a little bit grey and it does depend on the reason behind the request. Yeah, no, as expected, because I'm, there's definitely two trains of thought on that. And it's a, a very fact specific um, sort of situation. So, Alex, um, what employers really want to know is what are the risks of getting it all wrong here? Yeah, um, well, obviously, one of the main risks is, it's, is that someone brings a tribunal claim against you. Um, you know, I suppose you get the advantage of spending more time with us lovely solicitors in, in that case. But um, I think that some of the key claims that people tend to bring in these situations are claims for unfair dismissal is the most obvious. Um, you know, and, and the two key elements of an unfair dismissal claim are, in this case, you know, potentially having a potentially fair reason, that being redundancy. Is it genuinely redundancy or not? People might, might argue it's not. Um, and two, following a fair process which is everything we've just been talking about. Um, and I would say that's one of the most common um, areas of, of dispute and, and ways in which people successfully win their claims on, on the process. Um, should mention that obviously you normally have to have at least two years service um, in order to bring an ordinary unfair dismissal claim. You require that for, for that type of claim. Um, the second, I would say, most common type of claim is a discrimination type claim. Um, and I do think if... If you go into this, you know, with a sort of poorly planned, um, unfairly carried out process, um, it just really puts you at greater risk of a successful discrimination claim because it's not um, it's not a huge jump for someone to start saying, well, the motivation behind this poor process and the way I've been treated is because of some protected characteristic because of my race or because of my sex. So um, I think that's a common one. And, and obviously, the compensation in relation to that sort of claim is is uncapped, so it could be very significant. Um, I should briefly mention that 
although I've said you have to have two years for unfair dismissal, I'm sure many would be aware there are niche circumstances known as automatic unfair dismissal claims where you don't need the two years. And they can relate to uh, situations where someone, for example, has um, uh, made a whistleblowing type complaint or um, a health and safety, raised the health and safety concern in, in certain circumstances. Um, so even when someone's got less than two years service, it's not, it's not risk free. Discrimination claims still arise, you know, potentially other more niche claims still arise. Um, but I think the big thing is sometimes employers get, I think, a bit focused on, oh, well, what? If someone wins against us, what what could that cause? Um, it's not just that. It's actually it's for anyone that's gone through that process. It's 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 the time involved in it, in defending a claim. It's it's the reputation, and sure, then there's there is the risk of of losing the claim with compensation to follow. And looking at some of the other tricky issues that come up in a process, yeah. one common frustration is we've seen where. As soon as an employee is placed at risk of redundancy, they potentially go off sick, indicate mm -hmm. and then say, well, I, I'm not well enough to participate in the, the process. Um, you know, or sometimes they put in a grievance. Any guidance on dealing with that? Yeah, um, so it, you're right. You know, it's a, it's a common situation, you know, that we deal with. Um, and of course, redundancy processes, they are going to be stressful for people. Um, so, you know, there are lots of situations where there, there is a genuine issue there, um, you know, and, and they're genuinely not not well as a result of it. But um, equally, we come across lots of situations where, you know, it may well be quite cynically motivated to just sort of disrupt this process. So I think it's worth being aware of that um, and, and preparing yourself for it. Um, so I think dealing with the two separately, sickness, um, I think, number one, be prepared it might happen, you know, and, and when I say that, it's thinking about things like, well, what sick pay provisions do you have in place in your organisation? If you've got really um, in, very much enhanced sick pay provisions, might make it more likely that someone might might go down that route. Um, so think about that. Um, biggest thing I would say is, and this is true of any period of sickness, do not bury your head. Be really proactive about it. Um, you know, don't just think, oh, OK, well, we better not talk to them because they say we're stressed. Um, I would say do the opposite. Keep in contact with them within reason, obviously. Um, encourage welfare discussions with them. Um, just generally keep in contact. In my experience, you might get some pushback from an individual in that regard. But rarely is it the case that a tribunal is going to criticise an employer um, for asking about the health and well-being of, of their employees even though some employees might might do so. Um, I think the other thing I would say is being unfit for work or signed off by your, your GP as being unfit doesn't necessarily mean that you can't attend um, a redundancy meeting. So it doesn't mean you can't have a Zoom call to, to continue the consultation. Um, it's, it's not uncommon that someone will, will then say, well, we can't, I can't because I'm, I'm too stressed or too unwell. Um, and in that case, I would normally advise looking at inviting them to a welfare meeting, see how they are as an alternative. If, which again, isn't uncommon, they say, oh, well, I can't, I can't attend any meetings, including that one. Um, then all of this does depend on the circumstances, but often I might look at very quickly getting in, in place a occupational health report. Um, and, and when doing that, importantly, asking that occupational health consultant specifically, can they confirm whether they think this person could turn up to to have these meetings um, because I in my experience quite often the consultant will err on the side of saying yeah I think they're not very well but they can attend these meetings and it might actually be beneficial to get through this process with them uh, consider reasonable adjustments that you know I've mentioned that before but you know think about it if this person has a potentially has a disability you're under a duty then to to make reasonable adjustments so think about that and act accordingly um, Ultimately, of course, you may have to just progress. Uh, you know, I've dealt with several situations where you just have to progress in, in writing because the person just isn't, isn't going to turn up. Um, and what I would say is you need to tread carefully before you get to that moment. Do take legal advice on it and, um, and make sure you've got your sort of, you can evidence that you've been reasonable in, in taking that decision at that point. The other aspect you asked me about is, is, is grievances. Uh, you know, I think key things with that are don't get bamboozled with it during a redundancy process. Follow normal procedures. 
try and avoid significant delay to that redundancy process, um, especially if you think the person is deliberately trying to disrupt it. Um, the first thing I always do as well is I look at, well, what is this grievance about? Is the grievance about the redundancy process itself, which often it might be? Um, if so, I often take the view, well, look, we can deal with this. This is just a complaint about this consultation. We can deal with this as part and parcel of the cons consultation meetings, basically. So we can wrap it into, into one. And if it isn't about the consult, if it's got nothing to do with this whatsoever, the redundancy, then, you know, can it be hived off and, and handed to someone separate to deal with, with that redundancy consultation um, continuing? Depends on the circuit. I would normally try and conclude a grievance before a decision to dismiss, but it does depend on the circumstances. Thanks, Alex, for that. I'm just going to answer a, a question that's come in. Um, I'm not sure that it's visible to everyone, but the question is, can we can we cover trial periods and alternative roles and considerations for dismissal thereafter? Um, I guess I'm happy to sort of talk a bit about that. Trial periods, I find... Um, they're quite technically sort of specific as to when a statutory trial period um, uh, is sort of used because there's a there's a statutory mechanism where if there's a, a sort of potentially suitable alternative that you can have a four week trial period and in that period sort of both parties decide whether or not it's suitable for them now it's obviously ripe with problems because the employer might say, well, it is. And the employee will say, well, no, I don't think it is having you know, tried it for a month. Um, and, and and we go back to what Alex was talking about earlier, which is, you know, is it suitable alternative? And you're looking at things like status, job content, pay, hours, location, sort of exposure to promotion, that sort of thing. Um, so then you sort of come back to, yeah, if you're then going to dismiss because it's not it worked out from the employer's point of view, if, if they're the ones saying well, it's not worked out, then it, they, you would just pay the redundancy pay as usual. But if the employee is saying, well, it's not worked out for the, me, but the employer is insisting, well, we think it is working, that's when you start to enter problem territory and, and you have to really drill down into is this a suitable alternative because it, if it's not you, you can't force them into that and um, as I said the statutory scheme is very specific as to sort of timing of that alternative job offer um, you know the day that it starts the period that it covers and all of that sort of thing but what I'd always say is there's nothing to stop and I very often see this happening in practice the parties agreeing a sort of separate you know, trial period where, but where it, you know, they'll say, you know, look, there is this role. We're not really sure that you're suitable for it, but what we're prepared to do is look, go into it. We'll review it in, you know, whether it be a month or two months time, and we'll see. But what we'll do is, if we don't feel that you know it is working, you know, we will then terminate for redundancy. <clears throat> so you can agree something else that falls outside of that statutory um, trial period scheme, because as I say, it is fairly prescriptive, that scheme. Um, hopefully that's answered that question. Um, Antonio, I was go just going to touch upon asking about um, in pregnant employees on maternity leave. Um, what's the position with them? Okay, well, of course, there's a statutory right for pregnant employees and new mothers to return to the same job after maternity leave. However, if there's a redundancy situation, they can be put at risk alongside their colleagues. But of course, they shouldn't be selected because of pregnancy, childbirth, or for taking maternity leave. So it goes back to what we said before, if you're looking at attendance, making sure that, that uh, any att non-attendance due to uh, reasons related to pregnancy or childbirth and maternity leave are discounted. Uh, so they can be part of the process, but it's also really important not to leave them out of the consultation process. You know, they have to be included uh, and get all the information that their colleagues are getting. If it's not practicable to employ an individual under their existing contract because of the redundancy situation, then they are entitled to be offered a suitable alternative vacancy with no less favourable terms. And that should be offered to them over and above their colleagues. 
So this is a special provision which goes to people, those on maternity leave, and it's something that they get which their colleagues don't. They have the right over their colleagues to a particular position that is suitable and with no less favourable terms. So it's an example of positive discrimination. Mm -hmm. And if the employer doesn't comply with this, the employee will have a claim for an automatically unfair dismissal. Thanks. And it's also worth uh, sort of reminding everyone um, that soon the sort of protection for um, either sort of um, people who are pregnant or returning from maternity adoption or shared parental leave, it's, it's due to be extended so that... Um, redundancy can't take place for a period of six months after return from any of those types of leave and the bill um, has gone through parliament it's received royal assent on the 24th of may um, and we're just essentially waiting secondary legislation to actually implement those changes so watch this space on that and now we've sort of saved the best till last i like to think alex um a lot of employers that we deal with you know we've gone through all the best practice how to do it but really what they often want to do is just speed the whole process up, cut to the chase and, um, you know, use a different method. So what are the shortcuts for employers who are looking to, to speed this process up? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, as, as exactly as you said, really common, um, you know, and, and I think a big part of being an employment solicitor is working with companies, you know, sort of and understanding their, their commercial aims and matching that with advice surrounding the, the law and looking at ways in which, you know, I think clients will, might say, oh, we want a short circuit. There are things you, you can do. Um, I think one of the most obvious um, and something that I always discuss with clients um, right at the start of that planning stage is looking at, well, um, are you going to essentially try and agree a deal with an employee um, to, to leave employment during that process? And the most obvious way in which someone does that is um, via a settlement agreement or a settlement arrangement of some description. Um, and that tends to flow from a discussion, which is commonly referred to as a without prejudice discussion. I'm sure many people listening will, will be aware of that and will have, will have had them. Um, really, really common for those types of conversations to take place during redundancy process. Not required, but common. Um, it does prevent, you know, I should probably explain. So for those who haven't dealt with it before, what is a without prejudice conversation? Well. In essence, it is a particularly particular type of legal protection that applies to a conversation, which essentially means that uh, the or, or communications, you know, on emails, etc., which means that that can't be relied upon um, by an individual should they then bring a legal complaint. So, you know, uh, without prejudice, email or conversation can't be shown to a judge as evidence by that person to say, look, these people are trying to get rid of me. So, what it essentially does is enable uh, a zone in which you you know, both parties can have a frank conversation um, about another option, um, which is to agree a settlement before this redundancy process um, concludes. I should mention there is also something known as pre-termination discussion, which is sort of quite similar, but with some slight differences. I'm just going to refer to without prejudice for the sake of ease here. Um, so what, what can often happen is if an employer wants to short circuit that process, um, I would normally recommend that they they start that process um, and then go on to very shortly afterwards, um, invite the person to have a without prejudice conversation um, and put some proposals to them. I think key points to add to that is um, you can't just go, there are certain rules that apply to the, to have this legal protection for without prejudice, certainly, some of the key things you need to have in place is one, you need to be having a conversation about settlement. Well, most of the time that's not a problem, but probably a more important aspect that gets forgotten about is you need to be able to show that there was a pre-existing dispute before you had that conversation. I've seen employers get this wrong and it, and it causes real problems where they haven't even mentioned redundancy to someone and they just go in and say, let's have a without prejudice, you know, and there is a good argument that that is not covered by the without prejudice rule. So it creates a real risk. For that reason, I personally always recommend that you you start um, the redundancy process if you're going to have that type of conversation and then have it because there is then uh, uh, a clear dispute that you can point to. Um, I think the other thing I would say when you're having those conversations are <laughs> obviously have a cl clear plan of what you're going to be offering when, when you have it most of the time. Most of the time, I would recommend that you, you 
you, you're fairly ready to put an offer and you do often just put a offer, even if it's in headline terms to the individual. Um, have a careful think about what that offer looks like. I've had clients, you know, where they, they want to put what is like a really measly offer, a really small amount proposal to an individual. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen that go really wrong. I think that that can wind up a situation rather than help a situation. So if you're going to make a really tiny offer. I generally wouldn't suggest you make any offer and you go through the process we've just been talking about, the, the open process. Um, think about having a solicitor on, on standby because normally you'll need to put in play a um, quite a detailed settlement agreement quite often if, if that's agreed to. Um, so those are some of the key points I would say, but yeah, personally, I, I encourage these conversations a lot when employees are going through this process. I do think actually this can be a much more amicable way to, to end a relationship if you think it's quite likely that that consultation is going to result in the redundancies of those individuals. Um, and from the employer's perspective, it can also save the time, management time, but also the, the, the costs of going through those processes um, enables them to get on with whatever their commercial aims are often sooner. Um, so, and, and also most deals would involve the employee giving a guarantee that they're not going to bring any legal claims. So you get a degree, of, you know, you get a guarantee in that regard. Yeah. Thanks for that, Alex. And thanks to both of you for all your input in the webinar today. And um, so that's us done. I just remind anyone who joined late to download the redundancy guide or put in the chat if, if you have any issues um, downloading it and we'll send it to you afterwards. Um, our next webinar is on disciplinary and performance management where we're going to provide practical advice on how to manage employee performance and conduct issues effectively. Um, I'm also pleased to say that by popular demand, we're arranging an in-person um, event on the 18th of October. So put that date in your diaries um, if you might want to come to our HR lunch club and um, we'll actually sort of meet some of you in person at last. Um, if you've got any further questions about sort of today's webinar or you know any questions about redundancy or anything to do with employment law, please do drop us a line. All our contact details are on the invite to the webinar or you can find us at www thomasmansfield.com so we'll say goodbye for now and we'll see you at the next webinar and hopefully we'll see you in person at our event on the 18th of october bye, bye.